I know. Uh, so, uh, so that's wonderful. Um, we're going to do two videos again because we're uh, we want to use the wisdom, um, the summary of wisdom literature again to introduce this book of Ecclesiastes. And so uh, we can do the two videos because I like the way the wisdom stuff introduces us to wisdom literature, especially the three books that they are encouraging us to read together. I, again, I've really profited from this myself, uh, that we read Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job together, all three as wisdom literature, and all kind of taking a different approach to this notion of, of wisdom. Uh, um, so let's just review. We've, we've seen this, but I just want to make sure we're picking up on um, where they're trying to take us. Remember, they said, okay, we're going to read these together, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And then they stuck images onto these books. Do you remember that? I said, um, Proverbs is like the, remember what that was? The young teacher. Oh, that's right. Who comes into class, is just filled with uh, wisdom and new ideas and uh, um, about everything, about everything in life. So it's one way to remember Proverbs, that if you- Lady Wisdom. Lady Wisdom, if you lead a good life, odds are you'll do pretty well. If you disobey God, odds are you won't do well. Is it a one-to-one -one correlation? No, no, not in Proverbs. Guarantees. Maybe in Deuteronomy, yes. Right? Deuteronomy, it's you do right. The, the, the universe is moral. It's got a moral structure to it. God has said, if you obey the laws, I will bless you. If you disobey, I will punish you. Punish you. Mm -hmm. Pretty clear in Deuteronomy. Just like you were clear if you had young children, right? With young children, it's Deuteronomy all the time. You know, if if you don't eat your, you know, beans, you're going to bed, right? Or whatever it might be. No dessert for you, or I'm going to take away the iPhone, I guess you'd say now. That's Deuteronomy. Proverbs says, okay, it's better for you if you eat your beans. You'll be healthy. You'll have more energy. In fact, if you eat too much sugar all the time, yeah, you're... you're You'll be happy when you eat the ice cream, but, but you, even as a young child, you're going to have to pay the penalty. And if you don't pay the penalty, we will pay the penalty as parents because you won't go to sleep at night or something, whatever it is. So Proverbs, it's about um, probabilities. Probabilities. Yes. Now, Ecclesiastes that we're going to take on today takes what role? The middle-aged man. Okay. The middle-aged man. <laughs> or woman, for that matter. <laughs> Can we hear an amen? amen. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah. But he doesn't, he, he, it is a middle aged man, but he calls him a skeptic. Well, look, he's a, he, Not that all middle aged men are skeptics. But, but there's a distinct difference here, and I think this is important. He's an enlightened skeptic not a cynical kind of a skeptic. Mm. So in that enlightenment allows him to say, yeah, but you better watch out for this, but nevertheless, there's still something higher we're gonna aim for. Okay, so, um, yes, but your impression of the book when you first read it can be not that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it's good to hold on to that view that he is a skeptic and he is being put on the stage to mess with our minds a little. Okay. He is being put on stage by someone else here to deconstruct a little bit Proverbs, if I can put it that sharply. So here we've got this nicely ordered moral universe, God's behind it. And we think like Deuteronomy or maybe like Proverbs, and we think, okay, Fear of the Lord, give me wisdom. I'll do these things, things will work out for me. And then this Ecclesiastes, this middle aged skeptic, gets on there and says, It's all smoke, vanity, hevel. What is it? Smoke, hevel. <laughs> 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 
Tommy will have those like oh. breath or smoke or vapor. Yeah, yeah and, and we're going to want to watch how he describes that because sometimes in some of your translations, it will say meaningless. Yeah. Life is meaningless. And I think they're accurate here to say, mm, that's a no. But the meaning is like smoke, that when you try to grab it or try to hold on to it or try to preserve it, you know, you, you just, it, 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 it vanishes. Maybe it also came up with something like, you can't put it in its place, it's infinite. Or enigma, I think they put used that as too. So we're going to be struggling with some words here, right? And, and we'll struggle with some of our old words like "fear of the Lord," but we got some new ones. Deidre has a message. <clears throat> okay, we've got somebody trying to get in. Oh, thanks. Oh. Uh, hang on one sec. Uh, so. There are two people who will play a role in Ecclesiastes. There is this middle-aged skeptic, the, the, the teacher, yeah, yeah. but there's also the author. And the author, it would be like uh, the person at the university, let's say the dean of the school, who invites the skeptic to come and lecture, right? You've all experienced that. And then someone goes up there and lectures and we go, oh, whoa, I'm not so sure about all that. Uh, but then the author comes at the end and frame some of these things like what you said in particular. Um, so he's allowed the lecturer, I like to say lecturer rather than middle-aged skeptic, same thing. Um, he's gonna allow them to redefine or deconstruct what we thought we knew about wisdom and God's law. And then the author's gonna say, but okay, okay, there's still do fear the Lord. And so I, I kind of like, I'm going to read this. This is a chapter five. And I read it, I think, to reinforce what you were saying. He's not a skeptic in the sense of life is meaningless, so do what you want or give up. Or, 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 you know, because usually that's what, when we say life is meaningless, we think that's like the, you know, what do you do with that? It's like we're back in college reading existentialists all over again, right? Remember that? Mm -hmm. and, and Back it. <laughs> but then there was also the Kierkegaard. So, so all these existentialists then had to deal with what do you do after you say life is meaningless? Do you just give up or do you eat, drink, and be merry? Or do you, you know, will to power Nietzsche? I and mean, there's all sorts of answers to that. I don't know if you remember all those college debates, mm -hmm. but that those were real de debates in the 60s, because a lot of young people had become like Ecclesiastes. They had become young skeptics rather than middle-aged skeptics. Like, And those are the worst. <laughs> because if you're a young skeptic, the chances are you end up being a middle-aged cynic, <laughs> if you're not careful. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to read this one section. And because it's so strange, I thought, like in Luke 12, you know, the rich, old, the, the rich um, businessman, and he's living his life according to, as uh, Jesus says, of eat, drink, and be merry. That's a critique. That's a critique. It's like an Epicurean or a hedonist. And here, the writer of Ecclesiastes can use the same phrase, but for positively. That this is our response to living in faith toward God in a world where there's just smoke is to eat, drink, and be merry. And you go, wow, that's interesting. So we just want to hold on to that because when you hear that phrase, sometimes it's used negatively in the Bible, like you're a hedonist and you're not following God. Here, it's the exact opposite. Which is really interesting. So I'm reading in 18. This is what I have seen to be good. This is 518 again. This is what I have seen to be good. It is fitting to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun. The few days of the life God gives us, for this is our lot. Likewise, all to whom God gives wealth and possessions and whom he enables to enjoy them and to accept their lot and to find enjoyment in their toil, this is a gift of God. For they were scarcely brood over the days of their lives because God keeps them occupied with the joy of their hearts. Wow. Yeah. It doesn't say anything about them sharing their wealth. I find that very interesting. 
that's, um, it doesn't focus on that here. No, it doesn't. That's, the, I don't think that's the, the, the purpose. I, the, but I don't think the writer here would disagree with that. I think it meant that um, if you're living your life under God, that's part of it. So you would naturally be a, Wisdom a giver. I, I think that's right. I think that um, the writer here is saying, don't put your faith in your wealth because that's smoke. Mm -hmm. Don't even put your faith in your family, smoke. Or your career, that's smoke, right? 38 times. 38 times. <laughs> times yeah. Once again, Matt has done his homework. <laughs> but you know, it talks earlier in chapter five, and I haven't read it real carefully, just looking at it now about making vows and making sure that you pay whatever you have promised. In fact, he says, better not to make a vow to God. Right. If you can't keep it. If you can't, if you can't keep it, just don't even make it. But if you make it, fulfill it. So I don't know if that fits with what you read in terms of. Now, in chapter two, he also says, uh, uh, interesting in chapter uh, two, verse one, I said to myself, come now, I will make a test of pleasure. Enjoy yourself. But again, this is also the vanity. So once you hang your coat on, on something like that, it all of a sudden seems to disappear. That's a point. Rick, Rick, can't this be seen in several different ways? So I read it a little bit differently, and, and I'm sure everybody reads it differently. This is say, count your blessings. No matter what you're, this is stoic in a sense. No matter what you've thrown at, see it positively. Have a positive mental attitude. If your riches are small, enjoy them. If your riches are large, Large enjoy them, but make sure you stay positive about it, no matter what comes at you. That's a, that's very Greek, and and what's see and I, I just wonder you probably. It know sounds this. like it's a little Hebrew. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Greek. Yeah, it's, but it's not the Hebrew of the earlier testament. So when does Ecclesiastes actually put down on paper? Does somebody have a scholar a, 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 a study Bible where it says that? I think it's like nine twenty BC. What what does it say about? Authorship or um, when it was written, does it say anything there? Yes, it is. It said um, authorship and background. Traditionally, Ecclesiastes has been ascribed to Solomon and is thought to be the expression of the thinking of his later years. Actually, only the first section of the book gives an evidence of Sol Solomonic authorship. And even there, though Solomon is not specifically named. Many scholars suggest a post exilitic date for the book, 430 to 400 BC or later. Since Luther's time, it's been thought that Ecclesiastes was composed by a later writer who put Solomon's thoughts in the form in which we now have them. The title Ecclesiastes is derived from the Septuagint. Title significant, significant, signifying the preacher. Then it is Greek. So, um, if it goes back to Solomon, you're talking about, you know, just in your head, roughly 900 to 1000 BC. So, very much at the same time that one of the Greek. Well, what, what ends up happening, though, I think what that Kitty is saying is that, you know, it really comes into being, it, it's based on Solomon, but it comes into being in the Greek era. Which is which is 500 post, BC to post exilic, so after they came back from Babylon, you can imagine, you can imagine the children of Israel having similar thoughts and feelings. Let's say, like the Jews after the Holocaust, you've just gone through something horrific. Now, how does that change your thoughts about God? Right, and we know. The Jewish community has responded quite differently to the Holocaust. Some that strengthened their faith, others that's destroyed their faith, right? How can I worship a God who, who would allow such a thing? And so you've got this in, in the post-exilic time where Ecclesiastes, you can see, would resonate, right? Yeah, it's in the Septuagint, which is 270 BC, if I'm not mistaken, right about then? No, I think that's... Um, because the Septuagint was, was conceived in Alexandria, if I'm not mistaken, when it was Greek at that time. 
I thought it was later, but I'd have to look that yeah, up. Yeah, look up the century. Karen, do you have the century? Yeah, it's the 10th century. Yeah. That's what I heard, 920. Yeah. There. So that would be yeah. the Solomonic. Yeah. But it could have been that Solomon, these were some of his sayings, but it was never written down and, mm -hmm. and, and, and edited into a book mm -hmm. until, the, like, we know almost all the Old Testament was put into this book form post exile. That's when the scribes come back and they've got, they're trying to rediscover who they are. And so that, let's put all this stuff down into writing. It, it'd be like every once in a while, this happens in your family, right? Is that people are telling stories and telling stories, and then mom and dad die. But wait a minute, they knew all the stories. And now I'm panicking. This is a little self reflection here. Uh, I'm panicking because I don't know any, uh, uh, I don't remember all those stories. And so then someone rallies and tries to find every bit of the history, the family history that mom and dad knew, maybe the grandparents knew, but are, are starting to be forgotten. Because you say, these are valuable. I want to pass this down. This is kind of a lot of the Old Testament. After the exile, they're going, we've got to remember our books. We have to remember our story. We got to get these written down and published together. Okay. When I was reading this, my like the first word that came to my mind was the word, it's from French, and I never knew how to pronounce it. I had to look it up. Ennui. Mm -hmm. That This is encapsulated for me. Mm -hmm. um, and in my Bible, it says... Wait, wait. What's that mean? Ennui. Boredom. Boredom. Right. Well, more than boredom. Mm -hmm. I didn't know it either. I, someone told me this word, of, and like just getting... Um, it's just a word that... But, but it's a deeper... It's, 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 oh, no. it's a It's, it's, it's a, a trouble It's a satisfaction, boredom. yes. Mm -hmm. And... When I read this, that was the first thing, and it says in my Bible that Solomon was this was written later in his life, and he lived much of his life like apart from God. So that sets the tone, like, and and I thought, wow, I mean, this is this book is powerful. I, can't see I really never realized how powerful it is. Now we usually only quote from chapter three. We all yes, know this because yes, we've uh, all heard yes, this yes, one. Yes. Uh, in fact, it was used uh, during um, the last service uh, with Pastor Steve. Uh, for everything, there is a season, right? We, we kind of like that. And a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal. Now, that's a little shocking. You know, you go, oh, oh. are we saying that as Christians, right? A time to kill, a time to break down, a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to throw away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Ooh, and then he goes into what gain have the workers from their toil? Uh, so we can see a little bit of ennui. I think the Germans would have called that angst, you know, which is often, but it, it's this. I think Ecclesiastes wants to take us beyond ennui and angst to a, um, a, a fear of God and a trust of God, not to fall into those traps uh, because life is vapor. So, so, so you can see this lecture is trying to undermine us a little bit or deconstruct, I guess, in a helpful way, right? And we've all done that at some point with, with someone we love. We can say, well, life isn't that easy, right? Uh, what, what did Pat Goodyear say last, last week? Sometimes, you know, your parent comes and says, you made your bed. That's sort of Ecclesiastes, you know, it's kind of a... Uh, you know, there's an, uh, an embracing wisdom. Now, the third one, by the way, is Job, and Job displays himself in that book. So here are the three of these, again, are meant to be read together, because each of them is going to promote wisdom and the fear of the Lord, but they're going to do it from very different experiences. And so we want to uh, enter in now to see the wisdom. Did, did we get that person on? We did. We did. Great. Can I just say one thing? Sure. Has anyone been watching the Wimbledon? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Well, this Eubanks has done so well. 
and I watched an interview and he said after he just let it go. Not Ecclesiastes. The wisdom means you could lose. You could lose. But you're to let it go and live in the moment. Enjoy the game. Right. I think that's what he was saying. And then he won. Because I think here, Ecclesiastes says, don't get trapped to think just because you allow now let loose and enjoy the moment that you're always going to win. But he had lost for many, many years, and then he became a sports commentator, and that's what turned it around. He uh -huh. saw the game from a different perspective. Huh? Huh. But I think part yeah, of the answer is right. one that my grandmother told me a story. And, and apparently this is an old story that has gone around many times. And she was driving with her grand, uh, her father at an old Model T in New Hampshire. And you had to go up backwards, by the way, up hills because of the gravity feet of the gas tank. So they're going up backwards and finally they get to the top of the hill, take a rest, and there's a farmer in the fields. And the farmer and, and uh, my great-grandfather says, that's a mighty nice farm you've got. It's so beautiful. The Lord has blessed you. <coughs> and the farmer says, yeah, but you should have seen it when the Lord wasn't my partner. <laughs> it was all weeds. And so the, the point, Margaret, I had I've had friends who lost everything because they gave everything to the Lord and let it be. And what it is is they forgot that you've got to be the partner with the Lord. Yeah. You gotta put your own soul oh, yeah, no, into it. Oh, yeah. right? kind of, but you always just it's always like this. Was he saying he won because of that? Mm -hmm. Or is he just saying that God had gifted him with these these talents and so he wasn't getting consumed with other things and just focusing yeah, on this? That's, that's like right. you said, it's a partnership. It's a partnership. Mm -hmm. Really? I, don't I, say I, that. I would look at it even differently in the sense that for that particular person in that particular moment. In their particular journey with God, they they see it that way. But that doesn't that doesn't speak for God. Do you see what yeah, I'm saying? Yeah, they're I speaking. They're... Well, that's really important. It's like Abigail, she's seven years old, and she says, Daddy, Daddy, you know, Poppy, we prayed that um, you know, there would be cookies at school. And there was, you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 and what I say to her is that's beautiful, but that isn't the truth about where you Pray. There's more to pray yeah. than that. So there's this subjective sort of beautiful journey. And then there's this bigger mystery of God, which says, you know, yeah. Abigail, that might be true today, but it might not be true tomorrow. Right. Yeah. And so, but that's, but that adds mm -hmm. to the person's story. It does. I just think they always take it out of context. And mm -hmm. like, they, yeah. So you try to proclaim it to the world, right? So yeah. you, you then say, since I prayed and it worked for me, Therefore, that's a universal truth that should work for everyone. That if it does, then you can pray right. That's right. So now you've gone, that's just what now you've gone off track. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and, and then, so Ecclesiastes wants to see the football player, yeah. not just the one who prayed and scored the touchdown and then gives all glory to God, mm -hmm. but also the person who strikes out and, or, or gets hurt still is able to praise God, even in. Um, even when you lose, right? Okay, so let's let's start. First of all, again, it's just reminding us this is part of wisdom literature, and then we'll dive deeper into the book. Today. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Three books in the Bible known as the wisdom literature, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. And they're all asking the question, what does it mean to live well in this world? So we've looked at Proverbs, who you could think of as a bright young teacher. She's all about pursuing wisdom, an attribute of God that's woven into reality. And she's optimistic that if you use wisdom, you will build a successful life. But then we come to Ecclesiastes who's more like this sharp middle-aged critic. And he says, you 
think using wisdom will bring you success, you'd better think again, because life here under the sun is meaningless. And that's a phrase he uses a lot in this book. But to understand this book, we have to realize first that we're hearing two voices. So first there's the teacher, and we've been calling him the critic. He's the main voice in the book. But he is introduced to us by another figure, the author. And he's the one who's collected the critic's words, and then at the end of the book summarizes everything <coughs> and gets the final word. So why does the author want us to hear from the critic? Well, he wants to turn your view of the world upside down, and he's going to let the critic explore three really disturbing things about the world. And we should warn you, these are pretty intense. Yeah. So the first is the march of time, or as the critic says, Generations come and generations go, but the Earth, it's been here long before us and will be long after. No one remembers people from long ago, and all the people yet to come, they too will be forgotten by those who come after them. And so, on a cosmic scale, you and I, we are just a blip. Stars are born, and then they die and form planets which orbit new stars, and those planets, they change over time and eventually burn up. And amidst this cosmic backdrop, my entire existence is like a blink in time. Which leads to the critic's second disturbing observation, that we are all going to die. Humans face the same fate as the animals. Death. All people. The righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, those who offer sacrifices to God and those who do not. They all share the same destiny. All this activity and madness, then we all join the dead. Man, this book is depressing. And so is the final disturbing thing for the critic, and that is life's random nature. So in Proverbs, life isn't random. There's a clear cause and effect relationship between doing the right thing and being rewarded. But the fact is that life doesn't always work that way. The critic has observed a glitch in the system. He calls it chance, or in his words, the race doesn't always go to the swift, or the battle to the strong, nor does food always come to the wise, or wealth to the brilliant, or favor to the educated. Time and chance happen to them all. So his point is that you can't really control anything in life. It's just way too unpredictable. So if I want to master life, then you're setting yourself up for a fall. Now throughout the book, the critic uses a metaphor to tie together all of these disturbing ideas. Nearly 40 times he says that everything in life is hevel. It's a Hebrew word that means smoke or vapor. Like smoke, life is beautiful and mysterious. It takes one shape and before you know it, it takes a new shape. And smoke looks solid, but try and grab it, it'll slip right through your fingers. And when you're stuck in the thick of it, like fog, it's impossible to see clearly. Now our modern translations have lost the metaphor, and they usually translate Hevel as meaningless. But if you read closely, the critic isn't saying that life has no meaning, but rather that its meaning is never clear. Like smoke, life is confusing, it's disorienting and uncontrollable. So. What are we supposed to do with all of it? Well, surprisingly, the critic first of all acknowledges the perspective of Proverbs. He says it's a really good idea to learn wisdom and to live in the fear of the Lord. Really? I mean, he just said that doesn't guarantee success. But he knows it's the right thing to do. But secondly, and more often, he says that since you can't control your life, you should stop trying. Learn to hold things with an open hand because you really only have control over one thing, and that's your attitude towards the present moment. Stop worrying, he says, and choose to enjoy a good conversation with a friend, or the sun on your face, or a good meal with people that you care about. The simple things in life. Yes, and both the good things and the bad, because both are rich gifts from God. And that's the surprising wisdom of Ecclesiastes. Listening to the critic is painful and can lead you into some dark places. And that's why the author speaks up at the end of the book. He doesn't want you to lose hope. He wants to make you humble into someone who trusts that life has meaning even when you can't make sense of it, that one day God will clear the hevel and bring his justice on all that we've done. And so he tells us that the proper response to all of this is to fear the Lord 
and keep his commandments. And that's the book of Ecclesiastes. Now there's one more voice in the Bible's wisdom literature, and that's the book of Job. And he will bring us the final, much needed perspective on our journey into wisdom. Okay, what'd you say? What'd you, what'd you pick up from? Not much. I think I this is the poorest one out there in the I, series I've seen. Oh, I love the critic. <laughs> <laughs> this is so this is so Greek. This is the this is the, the dialectic. Okay, this is the conversation between the thesis and the antithesis. Which is the two? And to put the struggle between these two, and the struggle, particularly that's central to everybody, which is what's the meaning of life? Now they don't give you the meaning of life, but certainly I I really use this in my own life because I ended up figuring out what the meaning of life is. And it's very simple, okay? If you ask the, the question- The fear of the Lord, right? Sorry. Don't stop him. <laughs> I thought he was really going to surprise me there. But, but, the, but the fundamental question is for all of us, whether you're a Christian or anybody else, what's the meaning of life? And for me, my answer, I'm not saying this is universal for everybody, was to find meaning in everything in life. And I think that's essentially what this story is about, is how do I find meaning in the moment, yeah, also in the history, in the trends, you know, in the larger picture. If I can find meaning in everything that I see and hear, then life has meaning to me. Okay. So we got two opinions here. We, we got you're right. The next, oh, you know, uh, uh, and, oh, this is the best thing. This is sliced bread. And this yeah. is no, it's awesome. an ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> and I think if you analyze it too much, sometimes you are losing the meaning because you're not present. You're not. If you're just sitting there exactly. and just saying, "Why? How many Blowing thousand on. miles is that star for me?" Instead of just really looking at that star at that moment, tasting something. I wonder how this was made. I wonder how long just to savor the smell, the taste, the feel. There's a difference because if I can be very analytical and it's, it, it's, it really distances you from, from what you're doing. It really does. It's a protection. The bon bon in French. Mm -hmm. sure. You know, when I, the, the same sort of, you know, the, the critic, again, the Bible, the critic invites us to, to down a path of sort of contemplation about, about time and how time, you look at your kids and your grandkids and you look back on your life, there's there's a lot of things that emerge when you take the time to have some contemplation or meditation about time and death mm -hmm. and and uh, the randomness of life. Mm -hmm. there, there brings it, I think it, it, it either crushes you, it crushes mm -hmm. you to a point of something inside of you, maybe humility, um, the humility, the gracefulness of life begins to emerge. But I think there is a journey. There's a journey in sitting with those things daily. Um, to not, it's not that you check a box like, yeah, time is it's pretty crazy. I mean, you got to sit with that every day. And, and it, it kind of gnaws at you, wears at you those things. And, and yet there's something that emerges on the other side. So again, that's the blessing of Ecclesiastes to the parents. I think what Edie might be responding to was, I think the animation of the critic was so haughty. <laughs> you know, Sorry. and it's kind Nobody of like some, you know, like that's true. it's above it. Yeah, yeah, it's condescending. Yeah. Yeah. A dark thing. Not so much his message that, you know, time exactly. was on and he was going to die. We know that. Right? Yeah. Yeah. But, but how he's depicted as I was reading this, uh, the only thing that kept going through my head was Judy Collins' folk song. The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. It's actually Bob Dylan. Right there with that ecclesiastic song by the birds. You know, I was, what I've been thinking about this is, is uh, I just wrote this before I came in here a couple of days ago. It says July 10th. Faith is both a spiritual and a philosophical term. Jesus is the door between the physical and the metaphysical and breaks down the wall of separation between all. 
He is the one, the common law, the reality in which all exists. And that's how this relates to when I pick up that Bible, when I pick up the Bible, I find the most profound philosophical book that I've ever read. And I've read a lot of them, but this one makes the most sense as a, a way of life, as a view towards life, as something that you can dig into. Yeah, it's smoke. It, it's smoke. We know that. We know that, there, you know, not everything's ephemeral and all of that. And yet we struggle for meaning. Robert says, you know, and that, that's that's what we do. We struggle. To, what are we doing here? When I read this, it's the best handle. It's the best way that I can understand why I'm here. Why am I here? And just like, you know, man search for meaning. Yeah. It's what all of us want. We want to know what's our purpose on this planet? Why are we here? Why, why are we born? Why did I have all this suffering in my life? You know, what do I learn from it? And, you know, I'll just give you a personal example. You know, I was in Vietnam. I watched a lot of bad stuff in Vietnam, and I'm not going to get into the details. But what I came out of that is I asked the Lord to find, help me find meaning in that. And the meaning that I found out of war has helped me very much, not just with peace, but with collaboration and trust building. Now, a lot of people came out of Vietnam and they're homeless, they're mm -hmm. sick, they're in terrible condition because they couldn't find meaning in the war. I just have to, uh, I'm, I'm not, uh, I think that's important, but it, uh, Ecclesiastes, I think, would um, reframe that to say, how do you find meaning in for that today? Mm -hmm. Because it could be that you're trying to find a meaning for, let's say, the Vietnam War, and it's smoke, mm -hmm. right? So, so there is a sense of there's not an overall answer, but you found meaning or, or life's lessons, and I think you'd probably say you have to keep learning those every day because it's every not day. like you just solved the problem of, of, of meaning, you know. Um, you know, just on a personal note, you know, you, you, when you get married, you go up front and, and you say in sickness or in health, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're feeling great. <laughs> and then, and, you know, uh, what it says about marriage, Ecclesiastes. I know. And then you get, why would you do that? <laughs> why would you do that? <laughs> and, and then you go through, uh, like with me and Nina, 46 years, 44 of marriage. And, and so you get kind of attached. <laughs> And the meaning of your life is that woman being with her. And then she dies. And then you go, oh. and so people, you know, a universal experience for, for widows and widowers. So how are you dealing with that? And you go, well, it's, it's sort of surreal because what gave meaning is now gone for me. And how could that be? But it, Everyone goes through all those who, who suffer loss. And so then you have to then keep asking, so what does that mean for me today? Do I give in to sorrow or, you know, and some days you do, and other days you're trying to figure out, okay, how, what does walking with the Lord, the fear of the Lord mean in this particular situation? So when I'm reading Ecclesiastes, I'm trying to, but I'm thinking it's like a daily asking for me. It's a daily, it's, a it's in the moment. It's not like, oh, I solved that one. Right. Uh, that's what the Vietnam War meant, or that's what my marriage went, or, or whatever it is or that we're struggling. So to use the analogy, where there's smoke, there's fire. So, so with all this smoke that's showing up here, there's a fire someplace. <laughs> and I want to know what the fire is. That's the search. Right. Right. Uh, you know, piggybacking too a little bit on what you're saying, kind of back to the idea, if, if you reflect on the shortness of time, the sort of godly response is, what can I do today? Right. Mm -hmm. What can I do today in this little bit of time I have? Mm -hmm. And even when it comes to, well, uh, you know, I just, we were at a little get together, you know, for the 4th of July. Well, what's it mean on the grand scale? Not a lot, but we, we made the most of it. We with the family, right? Mm -hmm. And even in this concept of randomness, you, we could actually be the randomness of God, meaning you could pick up your phone and text an old friend and say, by the way, I was thinking about you today or something. I mean, you can be that randomness in the world for the grace of God. Well, let's remind ourselves, uh, we're going to play now, get a little bit more into the weeds of the book, but what were the three um, 
huge challenges that the teacher throws out. March of the time. Teacher. March of time. We're all going to die. Yeah. yeah. And the randomness of life. The randomness of life. And, and the march of time, I think Ecclesiastes uses more uh, images of, of the earth like a mountain. So, you know, the mountain is there and we climb the mountain and then we all live and we all die. Oh, and, uh, and generations later, they come back to the same mountain, so to speak, right? The mountain's still there. The sea is still there. The universe is still there, keeps marching on. And it's almost like, uh, <laughs> it's like in the scope of things, who are we? Right in, in the vastness of the universe, grains of sand on the beach. Yeah, we have stardust, we are golden. I've got to get back to the garden. <laughs> We're part of the story. We're part of this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, how many people have that banyan tree, the great banyan tree right out front here? Yeah, has watched people come and people go, and yet the banyan tree at the end of the day, the banyan tree outdoes us all. He doesn't care. Yeah. Yeah. But I think oh. that with the randomness, yeah. it, that's what causes you to have all these questions. And I think you have to come to that word that you're not going to have answers to all the questions, no matter what, no matter how long you live, no matter what happens to you. That's correct. I think the fact is that some things you will never have the answer to. So I, I'm almost tempted to ask that we, we had a great discussion on. Um, worship matters about two months ago and that was the conclusion of two or three people on the conversation i don't know the answers to my questions any, anymore i did when i was 25 <laughs> but i don't anymore and i'm actually comfortable with that that was the that was the phrase that i thought was pretty insane. and i'm comfortable yeah. not knowing some of the so you either have to go crazy or you have to give in <laughs> as soon as you think you have all the answers they change all the questions, yeah, they they change all the questions. Let, let's go back option. let me just get this one a little there's a third option and that is to find simplicity on the far side of complexity and i've learned later in life that that's really the search the simplicity on the far side of complexity i think that goes into uh, i mean a lot of grandparents, a lot of aunts and uncles experience this, right? That when you know that life is precious and vulnerable, and then you go visit your kids, your grandkids, uh, boy, you can focus in on them, you know, because you know this is a special moment. You know, because you've seen loss, right? You've seen what can happen in life. And so you enjoy those anniversaries or that Thanksgiving gathering even more just the moment because you know this this might be it it's so like you enjoy the baby sat for your grandchildren that time and you hadn't done it in a long time i had that not was done a good it story. a story but how, how hard can this be <laughs> <laughs> i used to do this all the time <laughs> yeah so let's watch let's now get in uh, uh, to uh, a little bit more of the description of the book a little bit more into to the detail so we want to um Tee this up again. The book of Ecclesiastes, it's part of the Bible's wisdom literature, and it opens with this line, the words of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now in Hebrew, the word Kohelet, it means someone who has gathered people together. And in this case, it's to learn. So it's often translated in English as teacher. And the teacher is said to be a son or a descendant of King David. And so there are different views about who this figure might have been. Many think that it refers to King Solomon, others to maybe one of the later kings of David's line, and still others think that it's actually a later Israelite teacher who has adopted a Solomon-like persona as a teaching aid. Whichever of these views is correct, the key thing is to recognize that the teacher is a character in the book and is different than the author of the book, who remains anonymous. So we do hear the teacher's voice for most of the book, but it's actually a different voice, the author, who introduces us to the teacher in the first sentence and then at the end concludes the book by summarizing and evaluating everything the teacher just said. 
So the author is someone who wants us to hear all that the teacher has to say and then help us process it and form our own conclusion. So what does the teacher have to say? Well, the author summarizes the teacher's basic message at the beginning and right at the end, and it's Hevel, Hevel. Everything is utterly Hevel. Now, most English Bibles translate this word Hevel as meaningless, but that doesn't quite capture the heart of the idea. In Hebrew, Hevel literally means vapor or smoke, and the teacher uses this word 38 times in the book as a metaphor to describe how life is, first of all, temporary or fleeting, like a wisp of smoke. But secondly, also how life is an enigma or a paradox. Like smoke, it appears solid, but when you try and grab onto it, there's nothing there. So there's so much beauty or goodness in the world, but just when you're enjoying it, tragedy strikes and it all seems to blow away. Or we all have a strong sense of justice, but all the time, bad things happen to good people. So life is constantly, it's unpredictable, it's unstable, or in the teacher's words, like chasing after the wind. Hevel. Now that's kind of a downer. So why is he saying all of this? The author's basic goal is to target all of the ways that we try to build meaning and purpose in our lives apart from God. And he lets the teacher deconstruct these. So the author thinks we spend most of our time investing energy and emotion in things that ultimately have no lasting meaning or significance. And he lets the teacher give us a hard lesson in reality. You can see this most clearly in the opening and closing poems, which focus first of all on time and then on death. So the teacher says, you can spend your whole life working and achieving because you think that makes your life meaningful. You should really stop and consider the march of time. For all of the human effort that takes place in the world, nothing really ever changes. So sure, we develop technology and we build nations that rise and fall, but go climb a mountain and see if it cares. It was there long before any of us and it will be here long after. I mean, no one's even going to remember you or anything you did a hundred years from now, but that mountain, it'll still be there. And the ocean will still be breaking on the beach and the sun will still rise and set. And so time will eventually erase you and me and everything that we care about. And if that's not disheartening enough, the teacher also can't stop talking about death all the way through the book, but especially in this poem near the end. He says, death is the great equalizer and it renders meaningless most of our daily activities. It devours the wise and the fool, the rich and the poor, no matter who you are, what you've done, good or bad, we're all gonna die and it's inescapable. So with these two ideas in hand, the teacher goes on to consider all the activities and false hopes that we invest our lives in to find meaning and significance, like wealth or career or social status or pleasure. So you think working hard is going to make life worth it? Think about the stress and the toll that that takes on you, all the anxiety and the sleepless nights. And by the time you actually earn some wealth, you're going to be too old to enjoy it anyway. And then by the time you have someone. to pass it on to someone, they may not even be someone who cares about anything that you did. Or maybe you think pleasure is going to make life worth it for you. Go for it. You know, live for your vacations, live for the weekend party. Monday always comes. <laughs> Everything is utterly hell. So what does the teacher advocate then? That we become pure hedonists or relativists? Well, no, that would be Hevel too. The teacher acknowledges the ideas from Proverbs that living by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, that these have real advantages. On the whole, life will probably go better for you. See, but the problem is that even living by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, they're Hevel too because they don't guarantee a good life. Good people die tragically and horrible people live long and prosper. There's just too many exceptions. And so even wisdom is a hevel. Again, not meaningless, but an enigma. Wisdom doesn't work the way you think it should all of the time. So what's the way forward in the midst of all this hevel? And here, paradoxically, the teacher discovers the key to the true enjoyment of life under the sun. It's accepting hevel. It's acknowledging that everything in your life is totally out of your control. About six different times at some of the bleakest moments in his monologue, the teacher talks about the gift of God, which is the enjoyment of simple, good things in life, like friendship or family, a good meal or a sunny day. 
You can't control these things. You're certainly not guaranteed them, but that's their beauty. When I come to adopt a posture of total trust in God, it frees me to simply enjoy my life as I actually experience it, not as I think it ought to be, because even my expectations about what life ought to be are ultimately hevel, hevel. Everything under the sun is utterly hevel. And so the teacher's words come to a close. Right here at the end, the author speaks up again, and he brings it all to a conclusion. He says, the teacher's words are very important for us to hear. He likens them to a shepherd's staff with a goad, a pointy end, which might hurt when it pokes you, but he says the teacher is trying to poke you to get you to move in the right direction towards greater wisdom. The author then warns us that you can actually take the teacher's words too far, and you could spend your whole life buried in books trying to answer life's existential puzzles. Don't try, he says. You'll never get there. And so instead, the author offers his own conclusion, and it's this. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of humans, for God will bring every deed into judgment, every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And so the author thinks it's good to let the teacher challenge your false hopes and remind you that time and death make most of life completely out of your control. But what gives life true meaning is the hope of God's judgment, the hope that one day God will clear away all of the heaven and bring true justice to our world. And it's that hope that should fuel a life of honesty and integrity before God, despite the fact that I remain puzzled by most of life's mysteries. And that's the wisdom of the book of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> you feel better now. <laughs> that, that dark figure with the smoke is gone. <laughs> you like this one? She's already, I like that one. <laughs> it's honest. <clears throat> So uh, before we uh, get to our groups, any insights, anything you picked up this time uh, as we're marching through Ecclesiastes? I just really like the end. I just 12, 13, 14, I think that was just like the way it ended. Why? To me, it just, it just rung true. And then I came up with some other stuff. I said, it, it makes you part of the book, the story, and it's a reflection and experience of life, mm -hmm. you know, and it's honest. Cool. It's brutally honest. It's brutally it's brutally honest. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, excuse me. Going back to the very first part of that, this is uh, apart from God is the key word. We belong with God, not apart from Him. And we are when we are with God, we are in our right place, right size, comfortable. The place where we belong is in God's plan. Another word for this is humility, and another word for humility is understanding to stand under, but with God, not apart from him. And 12, 13, 14, to fear God is to have a relationship with him. And if we have a relationship with God, we're all right. Good, good, good the spirit, yeah. On the spirit, yeah. yeah, I just yeah. love the journey of the whole Old Testament yeah. to, to yeah. their point. If you go even to the Garden of Eden, Absolutely. God said, you know, respect me and keep keep my keep my commandments which was don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and all these blessings are yours and of course we know the story there but then all these old testament books seem to always bring us back to could you just fear the lord and keep his commandments and then we go to another story and could you just fear the lord can become idolatrous yeah. so it, it but it's a different take on idolatry i think than, than this. but it's the same thing i think that's your point right yeah it's, it's, it's consistent one last thing for me was is life uh, proverbs is about probabilities this is about randomness but you know the two really actually do go together because if you play the probabilities there's less randomness in the world you know, and I don't think that was clearly made in Ecclesiastes, but it's an important one for, at least for me.
I like that when Proverbs is about <laughs> probability, <laughs> probability, Ecclesiastes is often about randomness. So that's interesting. And how, do you, how what does wisdom mean uh, in relationship to both experiences? Well, I was just going to mention that if you were a teenager in the 50s in Pennsylvania, <laughs> in my schools, it was mandated that you read scripture every morning. This was public school. And for some reason, Ecclesiastes 3 was, I think, the only scripture that many people knew. <laughs> about once a week, we would hear Ecclesiastes 3. Yeah. Why, why do you think? I, I don't know. Because it's about the only one we read in church either, yeah, right? It's, I mean, uh, 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 it's, it's almost like we don't know what to do with this book. Yeah. And so we just stay away from everything except for the beginning of chapter 3. Yeah, you know, for my class. Class. This is Epicurean. <laughs> In, in a sense, you know, not Epicurean in terms of being a glutton, but everything in moderation so that, you know, she didn't enjoy life the way, and that actually, and this is the message I think we're losing all the time is that people who believe in God actually can have more fun because if you enjoy every moment in life, being a Christian should be a lot more fun. It doesn't have to be. You know, you dwell on death every minute. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Christians have more fun. Yeah. <laughs> and they're going to be a so, so, to, so to build on. Christians have more fun. So, so to build. Well, there, there's something to that. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. That obedience to God is almost like a commandment. Well, how, how do I obey God? Well, there's the Ten Commandments, of course. But how about eat, drink, and be merry? Yeah. What? Enjoy life a little. Uh, enjoy the moment, right? The, the little, th as he says there, the little things as an act of obedience to God. Yeah. Boy, that's yeah. not what we usually say. Well, Jesus did. He, 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 he had a drink and was married his own still, people over his own. That's right. So uh, if, if he had just quoted Ecclesiastes there, it would have helped us a lot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to, to, let's just build on that, to that point. You've been at a party or on a cruise ship where people are just devouring each other. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And so here, Ecclesiastes is challenging a little bit the, the idea of natural law or rediscovering it because uh, it, once you just got one, if there is a moral um, structure of the universe, then to prosper, to thrive, you have to conform to that structure, right? Mm -hmm. That Proverbs. And, and I think that's correct. <laughs> Because when you push against right. something, uh, and if you're pushing against moral law, finally that law will come back and bite you. You can't you can't break it, right? Because once you so if you're are practicing um, uh, if you're having one night stands as a young person, and you just go around having sex with everyone unprotected, natural law is going to get you finally. Yeah. Probably, I mean, the probability yeah. goes up, right? Yeah. And you might get sick, or you might you might ruin your soul. There's all sorts of things, a lot but, of but <laughs> a lot of you might have a lot of children you have to support <laughs> later on. And like, so, natural law says, even though you thought you were just being free and living in the moment, let's say, what what you were breaking the law, and the law will get you. The, the moral universe will snap. Fuck the law, the law. And and some we kid about it sometimes, but we'll say, oh, karma. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that it's that sense of, of natural law, which is like a karma, which will get at you. To me, to me, Ecclesiastes though calls that into question and well, says, does it or does it redefine it? Okay, say more. That might be better. Well, well essentially, <laughs> if you take the, the passage in Ecclesiastes three about everything was a season, etc., what he's defining is that's the nature of the universe. That's the law. That's also embedded. So morale, the moral law, and the nature of law of of the universe itself have to be integrated together. Okay. That would be a redefinition of, and, and probably a higher order redefinition to try to explain the anomalies that are in some of the other parts of the Bible. The one thing about natural law, which is being trying, uh, which Roman Catholics have really tried to reestablish, especially in law departments, I like the University, um, and what's the one in St. Paul? St. Thomas. Yes, St. Thomas. Their whole law department was established on trying to get natural law again to be taught because at the base, it's finally God's lawgiver. God establishes the universe and the structures in it. And therefore, finally, it's not about a law. It's about God. Finally, in the end, right? It's not just I follow a principle or I follow a commandment, but I follow God. And there's something in Ecclesiastes, I think, which leans in that direction. It's not about just the law. It's about God, finally. Finally, you know, that's it's, it's, it's three. It's always giving me trouble. I don't like it because it sounds like it's okay. Hate is okay. War is okay. I think it means really it's that's the way of the world because we're sinful people, over. but yeah. that doesn't make it okay. Yeah. It's just mm -hmm. like we're going in a circle doing these things, but the way it reads, it's like, it's okay. Right. It so let, let's get in our groups and find out if it's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's, but it's a good one to look at. It's a good one to have open to take a look at because this is the, the text that we tend to focus on. Right? How do we use it? Get, get the groups. The group. Uh, yeah. And so, Jan, white man, I'm going to put you into a, into a, a room and we'll call be back in three minutes. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah. So um, two announcements. Uh, first of all, I'm I'm happy to announce that um, a candidate for Will's replacement now, um, Brandy Schneck. Um, her father died, I think, two, three days ago. They pulled him off life support, and the funeral will be in Pennsylvania uh, on the 17th. So that's Monday. She won't be. 
No, but she's coming now on the 28th, the 29th, and 30th. So uh, that's a good date for us, and, and that gives her a little time after the funeral, I think, just to sure. kind of to gather herself a little bit. So we're very happy that she'll come down, and uh, we'll be arranging things on Friday, but there'll be a, a meet and greet with her for those on Morningline Drive on Saturday, probably about 4 to 5.30 here, before the council takes her out to, um, to the Cheesecake Factory, I think, for dinner. Ooh, nice. The council <laughs> is the call committee. On this one because it's a term call we, we, we're just going to be if we call her it's for one year terminal call that gets her out of the seminary it gets her uh, ordained and call it gets us someone out at, at the park who can do that work and then we will form a call committee after that to think okay now permanently what do we do out there but so this is sort of sort of a stopgap measure in, in many ways uh, and so we, we are really happy about that. But uh, she's a mission developer, a mission in that field. That's what she has studied to be, yeah. right? She was in the same program with Mary Sue Dreyer. Who I won't mention that because Janet knows Mary Sue. Um, uh, the same program Will was in. To, but I think, the, the, and Will was here. He didn't really uh, learn mission development with what he was doing here, because but he could see Jose, and then of course he was given a mission development out of the park because that was his own, that was his had been his training. She actually did um, work at a site, a redevelopment site in New Mexico for a year. So she's had some experience and can reflect on that. So which Saturday are you talking about? 29th of July. Oh, okay. Of July. So that would be in the afternoon. And then of course we're gonna have a preach in the pavilion. That was somewhat of a debate out there because it's hot. Yeah. Uh, flies. Uh, Howard says there will be no <laughs> flies out there. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I've got a fly Howard swatter. <laughs> and you may see me running around. <laughs> swatter 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 there won't be any. That, <laughs> fan will, that was going to be the point. Fan will be installed yeah. by that time. And so I think the fan in the middle. It's a huge massive, fan too. Huge. Yes, it is. I, so I, think, I think even for the company is. Uh, and they're bigger bigger ones right so or, we're real happy about that so you can if you want to go out that sunday the 30th to hear her preach that's of course and it will be in the pavilion because uh, the, the point is if that's going to be the place she preaches more often than not then we want to hear her in that big space uh, outside so that'll be uh, wonderful uh, also uh, I want to highlight the Sunday forum. If you haven't, has anyone seen it yet? Let's get the cage. <laughs> I thought maybe the cage would be set up. Uh, so I, as you, can tell, you can tell Jim's, uh, I'm excited about this one. The topic is Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, and the oh, power of the cross. Celebrity death match. In, in, in a cage, cage match. In a cage. Yes. So people know I'm not this Are crazy. Still that cage. <laughs> They're not really doing that though. Yeah, they're, they're still busy. Well, see, Elon Musk's mother says no. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Why we even give them airtime is beyond me. Yeah. Oh, I got five on my. <laughs> I got five on my. <laughs> I got five. I got five. I got five. That was brilliant though, Rick. <laughs> That's the Rick. I mean, these, these, these uh, table talks are really, really, yeah, really, good. really good. Really good. Really good. I actually think we ought to have them. Yes, and you, you don't have to be because of the car. But we should you talk about like that. When Bob sure and I will talk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe we'll probably talk tomorrow night again. I think that's about that very thing. I think, I think that's. Karen, you know, because we can't do it Sunday, and, and I miss that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, uh, I think it's good for the church when we're having these conversations together. And then I think what happens is people then go to brunch afterwards, and they still talk about it a little bit. Or you, know, you, you if it's a good topic, you say, "Oh, I want to talk with my kids about this or whatever." Since we can't do that for a while, uh, the idea is if we can have uh, interesting enough topics. Where people will discuss them at home or with friends or well, you know and, or even if we get here at, at, at church together the zuckerberg uh, uh, elon musk i just can't stop <laughs> thinking about it. Um, and i i don't necessarily really respect both of them or, or hold them up in, in many ways and yet just the idea of these two billionaires powerful industrial mm -hmm. leaders Fighting in a cage, a cage match. Well, now it might be a lawsuit too because he wants uh, he wants to sue. Why uh, Elon Musk wants to sue Meta 
with a Zuckerberg saying that just adds it adds to the to the whole right. um, yeah, lightsabers. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the point of the piece is for me because I kept thinking, why am I so fascinated? Because I'm not fascinated with the individuals, but I am fascinated with that whole idea. And cage fighting is I don't know if you've seen it, but it's oh, rather yeah. rather yeah. brutal. Watch the women. Watch the women in a cage fight. I mean, it's uh, uh, something. But then you, I was reading First Corinthians one about the power of the cross. I went, what a! Oh, it's like two light years, of light, light worlds away. Yeah. When you talk about power and our fascination for power, what power can do, just in the human sense. But then we're God's wisdom. It says our wisdom is folly. And that God's trying to do something through the power of the cross. It's like, whoa, that means completely at odds with each other, which I think is the point of Paul's first Corinthians chapter one. So in any case, that's the, 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 the goal. Next week will be, because um, I was just dying to ask, so I'm so sorry, we're not talking about the Ecclesiastes here. Uh, Saint, uh, um, the cafe, no, uh, Cafe Milano in Washington, D.C. Has anyone here been to that Cafe Milano? No. I, I was also, that's next week. It's a place where Democrats and Republicans actually like to go and be with each other. It's a safe, a nice Italian restaurant in Georgetown. Have you been there? I have not. Do you no. know where it is? I do not, no. Uh, so he's just created this environment where opposing sides actually feel safe to go there and talk. And they're protected when they go in the restaurant. No cameras, right? I mean, now people want to be seen together outside the restaurant. People want to be seen entering the restaurant, right? But he does everything to accommodate conversation, and people take him up on it. I thought that's a great vision for the church, actually. You know, serve good food, be a safe place where different people from different backgrounds with different opinions can still come together. But you do that, Pastor Rick, when you have when you have the meetings when you would say about the rules and what, what are we doing when we get here the rules and regular but you you do promote that when you do that yeah because i think that's what the church ought to be well, but i think that's you, you know to you. another relevant point um you did the one on live golf at pga which which just to your uh comp yeah. to complimenting you because this week there were the hearings yeah. and and i actually listened to a good portion of the hearings because of our conversation, and then a chance to hear um, Senator Blumenthal, and I won't get into it, but it, it it really just deepens this sense of, I don't know, uh, like you said, the moral uh, fabric of, of um, the conversation and the greed, the money, the power, mm -hmm. and um, so and these are these are just these are relevant, relevant topics, yes. which has an ecclesiastical sense to them. Yeah. And the, and the idea that we ain't gonna solve this, you know. I mean, like there's a there's a kind of craziness sure. acceptance to it, and yet we want to fight against it. Yeah, yeah I, I I think that's right. So I'm trying to read the paper every day, trying to think of okay, what you know, what would be uh, how do you bring your faith to any of these topics? Right, and because sometimes it's just like a whole other world, and we're not bringing our faith to any of the things we're reading about. It's like, oh, that's Monday, and Sunday's over here, and we just can't, we can't bring the two together. So, okay, that's the fun. Put on your Sunday face. <laughs> Get out your pickle and put on your Sunday face, just for like two minutes, and because I want to respect the time. Any any insights from um, Ecclesiastes in your group that you want to bring forward? Let me ask them, will you go back and read this? Is this, gonna, is this gonna be on your nightstand, you know, so to speak? Uh, will this be a book of the Bible that you will now return to and use? I think it, I, yeah. think it, I have a new appreciation for it. I like it better. I really do. Okay. Um, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. I'm ready for it. Good, good. Because you know what it reminds me of this this part of the conversation. It's like when you have a Jehovah Witness come to your door and they're like, Oh, aren't you just worried about all the pain and the suffering and where the world's going and it's going downhill? And we're all gonna, you know, and it's like, well, no, because of my faith and I'm saved, I know heaven. 
And they're like, oh, okay, and they walk away. No business here. It gives you the hope for all these bad times. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, that's funny that you say that I had Jehovah Witness knock on my door last week. And they gave me a pamphlet that was on um, oh, yeah. well, patience. Oh, the I'm very patient. December, I listened to everything December. they said. It was a lovely day. And well, it's them on the way. It's it's on the way. Up <laughs> some Saturday that they're inviting you to. So I got one, too. I think but it they was didn't last talk week. To you, they didn't, was it last week? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, it was the week before. <laughs> I had plans. They Everybody got the brochure. Got the brochure. I think we've often mentioned here, you know, sometimes if you watch the news, regularly or you're reading following what's going on yeah. it, you can get cynical yeah, no, for sure. and you can kind of get down it's very negative yeah. very ne negative and of course it's meant to be negative right it, <laughs> if, you, if it was positive you wouldn't watch it so yeah, like ecclesiastes <laughs> what i hear margaret ecclesiastes prepares us for that a little bit where we don't have to panic mm. we're almost expecting it right and and then it's faith in God gets us through it, mm -hmm. right? We we don't panic because again, I, I I think that's what some of the some of what cable news and what the papers are you know to get our attention. They negativity and fear always <laughs> trumps everything else. You know that we well, always. And then if you don't panic, you can ask God to direct you in how you can live your life in this in this situation. In the moment, mm -hmm. in the moment, right? Exactly. All right, let's then close with a word of prayer again. We love when uh, people join us uh, live stream. Are they still there? They are. Yeah, it's white man. <laughs> good, good, good that you keep it. Uh, it's good seeing you on the, on the big screen. Uh, good and gracious God. Indeed, we learned the hard lesson that life is smoke. And yet, you were always with us. You are the, our rock and our salvation. And your steadfast love gets us through each and every situation. Help us in faith and trust in you to enjoy our moments today. That we might indeed in your presence uh, eat, drink, and be merry. And not just wake up and smell the coffee, but enjoy the simple pleasures that you have placed before us each and every day. Great is your faithfulness to us. Um, bless us now in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Absolutely. Thanks. All right. Next week. Song of Songs or Songs of Solomon. Which one is it? Is it Song or Songs or Songs of Solomon? Song of Solomon. Because in the Bible it says Songs of Solomon. <laughs>